Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Arush Mishra, and I'm the Access to Healthcare Team Leader for the Next Generation Service Corps. Today, we are joined by Dr. Dennis uh, Cortezzi. Uh, Dr. Cortezzi is a medical doctor and acting director of ASU's Healthcare Delivery and Policy Program. Dr. Cortezzi was previously president and CEO of the Mayo Clinic and former head of the Mayo Health Policy Center. Today's discussion will cover some of the important issues relating to access to healthcare within the US, such as leadership, technology and innovation, and legislation. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Cortezzi. Yeah, hey, well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And how would you, how would you uh, like to start? I, I think your topic, as I gather it, is, is the access component. Um, mm -hmm. The, the questions are broader than that, but I think now that I see that that's your main focus. We are part of the Next Generation Service Corps, um, which is called the NGSC program. Mm -hmm. And essentially what our program is trying to do is train leaders that are able to um, develop solutions to complex social issues by bridging the gap between the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. So our team specifically, is focused on access to healthcare and how we can further um, access to healthcare in local communities. Um, so we're working with um, a wide group of like uh, uh, public, private, nonprofit um, institutions, and we are um, having different sorts of events, such as um, talking to industry professionals, such as yourself. Um, we're volunteering and we're working on advocacy so that we can hopefully um, make some impact on this issue. So when you say advocacy, uh, that usually means doing some lobbying or talking to people. Who, who are you in touch with and who does that work for you? Yeah, so we are currently talking to some politicians about um, potentially having them also come in and speak and also finding out how we can help um, with this issue, um, with this issue, um, part one of the alumni of this program is uh, Representative uh, Lorena Austin, and so she, her, I guess, uh, sort of policy was very based on uh, access to healthcare, and so we're um, going to have an event where we try and speak with her. Yeah, that'll be good. Yeah. First. Most and and uh, I'm I'm going to talk a little bit about this idea of advocacy. Most of the politicians relate getting insurance coverage as equaling getting access to health care, and this has been a significant um, a confusing point uh, for many many years. I've been I've been this is now 50 years I've been involved in healthcare, and it's absolutely 100 percent true that there are many, many people that have insurance and can't get access to health care. And if you're not sure about that, maybe ask your parents or other folks that you know of and ask them if they have insurance. Do they have any trouble getting an appointment? Do they have a problem getting in? If they get sick at eight o'clock at night or their kids get sick at eight o'clock at night on a weekday or especially on a weekend, where do they take them? Would they would they really want to go to the emergency room? And that's where most of the time that's where they have to go because that's what we have. So I want to make sure when you talk to politicians, they will frequently go down this route of talking about getting more insurance, put more money in the Medicare or Medicaid, etc. But I you can just tell them back, everybody who's over age 65 has Medicare. Ask any Medicare age person if they have trouble getting an appointment today. Most in, uh, in, in uh, Maricopa County, most providers are trying their very best to not actually take any new Medicare patients. So Medicare patients come into town, they have a very difficult time trying to get quote access to care and yet they have government provided insurance. So I just the first point, that's the main point I wanted to make across for this one, this topic, is that having insurance does not mean you have health care. Now, President Obama, when he did his stuff in 2008, equated the two. And he got I think he got so many people confused. 
they were basically saying, we passed this bill and now you have health care. Well, we still have 30 million people that aren't insured. So they don't have even insurance. And we have a lot of people insured in all different kinds of models. And they don't have as much access as they would like to have when they really need it. Um, so, and that, that is, this is true in, in spades in the UK. The waiting times is much longer than we have here just to get an appointment and to be seen. So the, the access to healthcare split it apart in your thinking and in your discussions with other folks uh, to, to really think about what is the difference between the two? And if they zero into insurance, I can guarantee you, you'll do a death spiral in your discussion. It just, it, it'll, it'll just go downhill because they'll all have positions about what kind of insurance is it Medicare, Medicaid? Is it, um, is it the federal employees healthcare plan, which is all private insurance companies that all federal employees have, including the president and others? Or is it Medicare or Medicaid, which are much more government run programs? Uh, there are so many different models. And then most people who are employed have some sort of private insurance, but they only have maybe one choice of the private insurance. Like one of my daughters has three choices at Caltech. Other daughter works for um, Forbes Travel Magazine and they gave her one choice. And she didn't like that plan. So she's she went out and bought her own insurance through Kaiser Permanente. She lives in LA. So she's in the Kaiser plan. That was her choice, but it's not covered by her employer. Uh, if you were to be a federal employee, you have many choices. In Washington, DC, you have about 150 different choices that you can pick from. If you are living out in California, I think my daughter who went to California to work at Caltech, when she went there, she was under the federal employees model. And I think she had 25 different choices to pick from a private insurers. So there's a lot more choice that certain people have, but the rest of us just don't have that choice. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an issue. Okay, so that's, that's my quick answer to what you're thinking about. So separate those two out and give some thought to it. Then, then you talked about uh, their, not their first question is, is really what the um, uh, next generation service corps is trying to do. And part of what they are trying to do is to encourage people to think, they don't, they don't call it this, but this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to get people to think systematically. They're trying to get people to think about complex systems, which healthcare is an extremely complex system. And therefore, whenever you're dealing with a complex system that has multiple smaller systems within it, so it's a, those of you who are thinking of doing engineering or involved in engineering, this would be called a system of systems problem. So a number of different systems inside it. And in healthcare, the, the minimum number of systems that we can think of within the overall system would be the system of how we generate knowledge, basic research, how do you fund it? How is it prepared? How does it get through the interface of how it is um, approved? And then the next system where this new stuff is coming into is basically um, uh, the system where the patients reside. It's in the delivery system. It's the healthcare delivery system within which there are thousands of different systems themselves. Every single academic center, all of the uh, integrated group practices, individual doctors, there's just so many subsystems within that one system. And then when you do something in that system, you try to get paid. And when you get paid, your bill moves out of your system and goes into the next one. And the next one is the payment system. All those insurance companies, the private insurers, the, um, the public insurers, uh, commercial insurance, for-profit, non-for-profit, big companies, small companies, and uh, the federal government has eight different insurances themselves. And I've mentioned three of them, Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, there's the Federal Employees Healthcare Plan, which is all private insurance. Medicare, Medicaid is more, more public. Uh, they've got the uh, military system. They have the VA, which is totally like the United Kingdom. It's all totally owned by 
the federal government. They own the hospitals, they own the doctors, nurses, and everything else. Uh, so there's multiple systems just in the federal government itself. Um, so that's a very complex area. Then you have medical legal that's out there. That's another system you have to think about. Um, so now that I'm thinking about this, I just before we joined here, let me let me share my screen. I'm going to show you a system that we're working on right now uh, as one of our projects in our delivery system. So now this is a system of systems diagram of a project we're working on with with um, lots of people about crisis mental health. Now you don't have to get in all the details of this, but I'll just I'll just take you through it. After after doing interviews with uh, over fifty different people, I began to try to sketch out. You think of the whole thing when a patient starts. This is the first part of the system here. When the patient's having a crisis, where do they go? What do they do? Well, they might end up taking themselves or their parents would somebody would take them into the crisis urgent care centers, of which there are many, and they each are different. They're their own system themselves, but you get the idea. Crisis mental health is one. Most of the time, there's a phone call that goes to the phone, the, the call. I call it crisis call hub. And the numbers they can call is a 911 and 988 number. They can call a company called Solari. And there's the state that has a number. And there may be even more. If, it, if something happens inside that system that doesn't get it right, okay, something could really mess up for that particular patient. But let's say it works well what they will do is make a decision and then go to the next system and send a response team out. Now that response team could be the fire or EMS, could be a police, could be mobile units that are run by Solari. So within each system, there is, are their own uptake. Then what happens is when they get on the scene, they come to see the patient, they do a primary triage. The primary triage, if it's done very, very well, they may send the, they calm the patient down, they may send them home, which does that, that does happen a fair bit when the parents are brought in. That help, helps pretty well, but they also may just make an appointment in a mental health facility for the next day or two. So they try to dispense, but a lot of times they transport. So you move up to the transport. Now, where do they take them? It depends very much on who making the transport, whether they go to a crisis center or they go to the emergency room of a medical hospital or whether they go straight to jail. So there are different options here. And then we have the whole judiciary system that can they can hold a patient in one of these places over here. Uh, they Within 24 hours, they have to do a ruling. And if the ruling comes out that they should confine the patient, they may be sent into the uh, Arizona State Hospital uh, or Valleywise with a court order. Otherwise, sometimes the patient may be able to take themselves right here on their own, but it's almost impossible to get in that way, believe it or not. So this, this has been an eye opener for me. Then when they, when whatever happens to them, they eventually all come out back into the community. When they come back into the community, they, they, there's nobody picking them up to do tertiary prevention, which means tertiary prevention means it's not primary, it's not secondary, it's not quaternary prevention. There's four types of prevention. Tertiary prevention is you taking people who have chronic illnesses like mental health and you treat them in such a way that you keep them out of the hospital. You're, you're doing it uh, really very proactive, taking care of patients, which I think you alluded to. What can you do in the community to try to make things better? Well, that's one way to do it. There are also ways to move over here into longer term thinking which is support models, social contacts, getting people to meet with each other and talk about things. And it's also dealing with the social determinants of health. That what happens then is the patient then comes back here. And if, if they are not going through this kind of a program, they'll come right back here and they'll cycle again. It just keeps cycling, goes around and around. And let's see if I can show you. I don't know why I have that there. There's the next. There's the diagram with all the flows that I just talked you through. We just we had a, a four hour meeting with all the people involved with this on Monday. And, and this was a work product. After all our discussions, 
we began to see it. So the question here is now is, is that what do we do? You don't have to know this, but this is what the the uh, the the and let me get rid of this. I get stop the share. This is what the um, service corps is trying to get people to learn. They're not talking about this, but they're talking about you have to look at it as a team approach, getting people together to work about this, understand what's going on, try to develop some things that you try and improve as you go on. Plan, do, study, act. You plan what you want to do, you do it, and then you study it, and then you improve it as you go on. This is the continuous quality improvement project. And I can tell you, when you deal with complexity like this, uh, you have to put yourself in the position of, from a leadership perspective, how are you going to think about it? So here, I'll ask you all a question. You don't have to answer it, but these are the questions I've asked every time I give a talk everywhere I've been to for since 2002. Would any of you like to be admitted to a hospital tomorrow? Would any of you like to be sick tomorrow? Would any of you like to be viewing yourself as a patient? And a patient defined is a, a person who long suffers or long endures. As you get older, like me, you probably will become a patient at some point. The question is, when you do become a patient, are they giving you the kind of treatment that you can live with the disease or with the problem? It's much better to go into the hospital maybe one time in 10 years than it is to go in the hospital every three months. And I have lots of examples of that. If you don't have insurance, that's what's going to happen. If you're on, if you got hepatitis C or drug resistant, uh, resistant tuberculosis or AIDS in the old days, you would, you would be going into the hospital quite often because you had nowhere else to go. No one else was taking care of you. So so what we're looking at in that diagram and what you're dealing with right now is the fact that the problems that you're going to be asked to be thinking about, and this is why as a leader, you're going to have to think differently. If you, there are, there are at least three different kinds of problems, probably four. One is a simple problem. And a simple problem would be like taking a recipe and making a cake. You follow the recipe, use all the right ingredients, and almost always you'll get a cake out of it. But actually, sometimes the cake will be better sometimes than others, and you won't really know why. But still, it's a relatively simple problem. You just keep adjusting it as you go forward. And uh, it doesn't mean it's an easy problem. Don't get me wrong. But it's a linear problem, linear thinking. That's, that's a simple problem. Next kind of problem you'll deal with would be uh, sort of working for NASA and going to the moon. Now, going to the moon, is a complicated problem. What I mean by that is that it involves the laws of physics and it's predictable. You can actually take the rocket, do something, shoot it up 200 feet, make some adjustments, shoot it up a mile, shoot it up further. You can, it's a linear process. You just keep improving. It depends on your technology. You introduce technology to that, but it's basically in, in the mindset, it's just continuing improving on a particular line and you will get to the moon. You'll get there at some point as a target. Now, we've had tons of moonshots dealing with cancer. You probably have heard one or two. There have been, well, I think the last one was under Obama when he asked Biden to run a moonshot for cancer. That was the fifth moonshot we've had since President Nixon in the 70s. We still don't have cancer cured. Why is that? Because it was too simple thinking a moonshot, do this, and this will happen, and do this, because now we're into complexity. Complex problems are totally different. It's like raising children. Use the same rules, same principles, do the same thing, and you end up with the results. You say, hey, how did that happen? You don't have a clue. The biology and human behavior is what we're looking at there. Biology is not the same as nuclear, as, uh, as Newtonian physics. And it's not the same as math. Biology has an element of change all the time within the cells and we get mutations, things happen, and it's a complex system all in of itself. Human behavior is a major complex system. So if you're thinking of tackling something that has to do with healthcare 
and you're going to become a doctor or whatever, remember, you're entering into a system that is complexity squared, minimum. Throw in politics, throw in policy, throw in payment models, throw in all these other things that go on, and you're dealing with a major complex problem. That requires system thinking. Looking at the diagrams, thinking about it, what can you do to perturbate it, accepting the fact that, that if you use linear thinking, you say, if we fix it here, it's going to fix the whole problem, you're doomed for failure when you're dealing with the complexity. You have to recognize that you may make some improvements over here, like in that diagram I showed you, we may improve the way patients are transported. But that doesn't mean they're going to get into the, the uh, mental health hospital. And in fact, you may make the transport so good that the backup at the medical mental hospital is worse. So you may actually make some changes in one part of the system and don't understand why it happened on the other part. And that is a routine example of what can happen in a complex problem. So the, the leadership of that kind of an issue needs to be much more flexible, understanding, uh, and, and, and frankly, if you, if you walk into that complex problem and you want to think linearly of how you solve it, that's fine because maybe one or two people can do it. But you got to have a bigger team. You got to look at the bigger picture. Otherwise, you're doomed for failure and you will find yourself suffering from the grief reaction all the time because you won't understand what, why it's changed unless you get to that level. So the, the most, I think the most pressing problem right now, I think this is your second question, is to improve access to healthcare, is to begin to understand what's holding it up. What is the problem? Why is it that physicians don't want to see more Medicare than they can deal with, more Medicare patients? It's because they're not paid an amount that they need to cover their expenses in a given year. Hospitals don't either. They can only handle about half of their practice at Medicare. They need to have younger patients come in, those that have commercial insurance, and then they end up paying more. There was a, there was a, um, a project done in Maryland for about 20, 25 years called the all-payer system. And it clearly demonstrated, and your politicians will not know this. And, and they, will, they will probably say, oh, that's not true, blah, blah, blah. But the fact is, if when they go to an all payer model, which means all the payments are the same price, Medicare, Medicaid, whatever, N none of this price gouging and right raising prices all over, all fixed to make that work. And it worked very well in, in, in uh, Maryland. The commercial insurance companies were able to reduce their premiums because they ended up having, they were facing charges that were lower. But Medicare, to make it work, and Medicaid had to raise the amount they were paying in the ballpark between 40 and 60 percent. So that's how much the federal government is actually underpaying for the cost of the care. And then the delivery system is overcharging for other groups of people like yourselves uh, that, that when you get into commercial insurance. So beginning to understand that and look at it will improve getting insurance. But then what is the hang up on getting access? And if you wanted to look at some project here in, in Arizona around the idea of real access to doctors, it would be a team effort to try to dig into what are the real causes for that? Why don't we have services at night? Why can't people be transported to, a, a, to certain places or others? There are restrictions by the insurance companies that are imposed to make that work. Why is it that during COVID, we were being paid to do telemedicine visits? Why don't we do telemedicine when people need it? Because when COVID was over and they eliminated that, well, let me back up. Before we had COVID, nobody would pay for telemedicine. Federal government wouldn't pay for telemedicine. When the emergency came, they decided they paid for it. So all of a sudden, we were doing telemedicine everywhere. When they removed that emergency about two months ago, when that was lifted, stop paying for it. Why? I mean, just you got to look back at the leaders of our political world and say, why did they stop doing that? During Before COVID, there are some models of care that were using hospital care at home. They would take care of patients in their home at a hospital level. Nurses would come in, IVs would come with them, take care of them in home. 
but nobody was paying for it. There were, the only way it was being paid is if certain groups had their own insurance plan with them. So it was a, not very common, but it was going on for 20 years doing hospital care at home. But regular insurance companies don't pay for it. Medicare wouldn't pay for it, et cetera. During COVID, everybody paid for it. When the emergency got re released, not being paid for. Having nursing provide a care in the home or for people who have chronic illnesses and you just need to keep them as healthy as they can, nurse provided care is not paid for by the federal government. Go figure. During COVID, it was. Now it's not. So we got three examples right there of models of care that are uh, we, that we don't have the ability to use because of regulations. This is why I get into policy times. Regulations that strangle the innovations that we can actually do to really improve access, and particularly for mental health. Telemedicine was quite good in at the me mental health level during COVID because there was very, very little else option to do it. So another question you asked is, what what do I see as technology innovation? I think fantastic. Yep. If, if I could interrupt for a second, sorry. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're kind of limited for time. So I wanted to actually move on to the um, fifth question, if possible. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, just so we can leave time for people to ask uh, questions at the end. Um, I know I had asked you to stay for 45 minutes. Um, if you wanted to stay longer, you're perfectly uh, welcome to do so. But uh, I, I just wanted to uh, repeat the question um, because uh, the attendees don't have a copy of the questions. Oh, so the sure. Question, Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, what advice do you have for students interested in pursuing healthcare policy, um, also related to healthcare reform, uh, legislation, and leadership careers? Um, what skills or knowledge areas should they prioritize? Okay, so uh, if th th this is a question that comes up all the time. Now, this is my personal view, all right? Others might probably tell you something quite different. My personal view is get your tickets and learn how to practice medicine really well. That's the first thing. Because if you want to then become a leader, because th to get into policy, you got to go in the reverse order of what you asked. You've got to be able to be able to lead. And if you can't take care of patients very well, your colleagues, you have to lead your colleagues. Your colleagues are all executive vice presidents like you are. You can't boss them around. You're in a, you're in a complex system. They have to have a shared vision along with you of what you want to accomplish as the leader. You have to have a shared vision to say, what do I want to accomplish for a policy change, for instance? And you have to build a consortium that will help make you succeed at doing that. So if you start, let's say, uh, in, in your residency program or whatever, and you see that there's some areas you think you can improve on, no matter what it is that can be improved, you're going to have to figure out a way to make that case and do it in such a way that the people will if you do it right, the people in time will develop a shared vision that you have and they will think it was their idea. That's if you really do it well, you have to share it with others. And I have a rule for that, it's called the rule of eights. So if you have an idea that you wanna improve the care for let's say a group of people in the ICU and you're, you're a resident and you wanna make that case, you're gonna to have to get some folks to agree with you. And you, you give a conference, you give some talks, you get, you get people in your corner them and you talk to them. And to talk about it, I, I kind of say, if you're starting something new that will make them have to change, you need to give them a reason that it's in their self-interest to try to improve the care for patients. So first you have to focus on patients. Patients are number one. Needs of the patient come first. And then the second rule of, of that is uh, you're going to have to build some sort of a teamwork or a group to make it work. This is not a new idea. This idea in the uh, Next Generation Service Corps, this was stated by Will Mayo, who was one of the two founders of Mayo Clinic, in 1910. In a graduating class of Rush Medical, he said, and I, there, he gave a speech to them, but the one line that made my whole career different uh, was that 
the only the, the the best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered. And then dot dot dot. When he got further on, he said, "And in order to bring advancing knowledge to the benefit of the patient, a union of forces is necessary. Focus on the patient, teamwork." Those are two concepts that have been so foreign in, in, in our country. It's just hard, hard, hard to even explain it, but it's coming now. People see they're going to have to have the teamwork. So as you as a leader, if you want to become a leader, you got to be able to focus on your own vision has to be clear. You have to be really clear and be able to express it and then talk to other people and try. And remember, you may have to say the same thing the same slides, the same words, eight times, different times, different locations, but to the same people. And when I meet with people, I actually count how many times I've done that. So today I'll probably do it twice, but that's not enough because it has to be a different time. It's got to be at a different time, a different location. So if you're going to start a quality improvement project, you have to get them to say, okay, okay, I, I, I'm there. So what happens when you're talking to your colleagues now? Because you want to be a leader, you're going to be leader of senior people. They're going to say, that's the dumbest idea I ever heard. Why? That doesn't affect me. I, I, it's other people, other people's problems. Fine. But you said it the first time. Then you do it. Then you have another meeting. You say it a second time. They're going to say, yeah, it's not me. I don't have to listen. The third time, I don't have to listen either. Fourth time, they'll start saying, wait a minute, this guy's still at it. Why? What is it? that, you know, uh, Cortese is trying to say something here and he's doing it over and over again. And um, what is it he's really saying to pay a little attention? And they kind of say the fifth time, the sixth time, nah, it's really not for me, but I understand what he's saying and they could actually give that talk by then. You get to the seventh or eighth time, they get to a point and they get frustrated. So why are we talking about this again? Don't you know, we, this was our idea. We want to do this. And they begin to take leaders. And you will find people coming up, taking leadership roles when you put a team together. That's the second rule. You need the square root of N. So if you have 100 people in your work unit, you're going to need 10 people, give or take, who agree with you and want to lead the charge. And it's going to take you a while to get there. This could take two years or more to get the right people involved. This is a skill that that is has, requires a great deal of patience you can also come at it and be the boss and just say we're doing this well good luck with that being sustainable for the long term they may salute you and do it and but i i, I had uh, military leaders uh, come to give the lectures to mayo clinic too about it and they consistently said we especially the generals we can't make anything happen we can just do the strategic planning and say, this is where we want to go. We have to convince all the people down the chain, the colonels, the majors, et cetera, to do it. Because what happened in Vietnam, our leaders said, we want to do whatever we're doing in Vietnam. But when that got all the way down to the frontline people, they had no shared vision. They said, we'd come down and say, we're going out on patrol tonight comes down to the master sergeants and they would say, oh, no, we're not. Because there wasn't the shared vision. They didn't understand why they were there. Our whole country didn't understand why we were there, basically. So this is a job of leadership. And it, it, you as a physician, you'll have to do the same thing for every one of your patients, by the way, to get them to be convinced that what you're trying to recommend do it's a very it's a microcosm of what i'm talking about and you'll have to monitor them and keep nudging them and keep working etc cetera, etc cetera. so leadership to me is is the first thing in the skills of that and, and, and we've done a book on that too and, and i think philip can provide that if you want to we have we have books we hand out i, I use it for a course uh th then if you want to get into health policy and legislation um i i say Good luck. <laughs> it's very, very hard. And what happens is too often is that the people who go into that have done some medical practice, haven't really led a big organization, and they decide to run for something. 
or they come out of medical school, they do a year or two in an emergency room and they wanna get a job in Washington to, to try to tell people how to practice medicine. That's great. They may be able to make policy. They may not make it better because they don't have any vision. They have to rely on others to give them the vision. And when that happens, you will be lobbied to confusion. The people in Washington will be lobbied everywhere to confusion if they don't have a clear vision of what they think is the right thing to do. And, uh, and, and it's, a, it's a very frustrating thing. Uh, I spent a fair bit of time in Washington, but it was never my goal. My goal was always just the, the patient come first. I want to just practice medicine. And that's what this diagram is about. We launched this little group and the patient is right up top. Remember, I started right there. What's the patient? And I ask every person that I work with, pretend you're the patient. What do you want? Do you want to be sent all over these other places when where you and, and be the last place you end up is where you really need to be in that psychiatric hospital, for instance? And it's very hard. You may not have seen all the diagrams that, that I mean, all the lines, but all the lines show that there's only one route to get into those mental health facilities and you can't you can't do it. It's just uh, it's a it's a crazy uh, kind of design. So I think the idea of learning system thinking, getting involved in projects that are bigger than yourself, that are working on it, but making sure the project is looking at it in a way that the team is testing what they do. You come up with ideas and you test it and you monitor it. You get your results. You keep me measuring it and keep improving as you go forward is a skill that fits into the category that I call the science of healthcare delivery. And there are courses that now are coming out. There are books talking more about that, but it's just delivery science. It's not basic research like you do in structural research in laboratories. It's not inventing new stuff. It's looking at the way care is provided. Are the outcomes where you want it? Are we getting good outcomes, good safety, good service? Are we getting lower costs, getting good access? Are people functioning better? This is boring stuff. You'll never get a patent for it. You're never going to be rich about it. But that's where you can improve the value of healthcare is to change the way we do things. And um, it's, it's, it's basically how do you take our current active ingredients and apply it to an individual patient? How do you get that patient to actually take what you're giving them? to use it correctly. And when you look at that, 80% of the people will, 80% roughly will use exactly what you recommend and they may do really well, but you gotta see them back periodically, but there's always gonna be 15 or 20% who will deny they have the illness, they don't take care of themselves. And if they're getting better, they stop their medicine because they think they're better. This happens in asthma, asthma kids all the time. You teach the kids how to me me measure their asthma and take their medications, they'll do a good job. A lot of them will. But there'll always be a group that thinks that they one, they don't have the disease, they don't want to take the medicine, or if they do take the medicine, gosh, it's been three or four months, I'm doing great. I think I can just stop or cut back. And then three weeks later, their asthma's coming back because it takes a while to come back and they don't connect the two that they stopped it. Well, what's a program that you can design to help them? Well, I'll give you one example. In Maricopa County, in Medicaid, for children between the ages of six and 16, there are about 20,000 kids. This is a few years ago, we had a project. 20,000 kids who were in Medicaid that had asthma, and uh, it was very expensive. Just in your own mind, pick a number here. On average, how many days, the, the sickest ones, the worst ones were about only 2,000 of the kids, not, not all of them, small number. In those 2,000, how many days of school do you think they missed in a, in a year? You get a number in mind. And the number, when we looked at this back in about 2014, 15, is 40 days of school. So they're missing 40 days of school on average for that group. Could you design a program to get them to take care of themselves better? Well, there are certain, there, the answer is yes, it can be done. You ask technology, you can use one of these things. You can get a flow meter reader ability to read. They can just flow into it. And every day they're, they're measuring their flows. 
because they have to measure it somehow or another. That's part of the treatments you got to do. And they can do this. It goes off into the ether. You can also buy actually flow meters that do the same thing. They, they are wireless. It goes off into the ether and it comes to a desktop, which a nurse is monitoring it every morning. And she would know right away, or she or the team, you have about 2,000 kids, you probably need a big team, a whole bunch of FTEs. But the machine, artificial intelligence, can tell you who has scored at a good level, can ignore them for today. But you measure it every single day. You also quickly know who didn't do the test. And you'll also know who's going downhill. If they're going downhill for a day or two, you know that within uh, 10 days, they'll be in an emergency room because these are really sick kids with it. Or if they're not using it, how you design something to get to the kid. You send them a text, you call them up, you call their parents, you call a guardian, you call the school nurse, or you get into a car and go find them. And those programs exist. Very hard to get paid for that. But they're out there. They're, they're out there. And um, Phoenix Children's has a program like that. They have an asthma bill that drives around now to try to follow the kids. In other words, this was the science of healthcare delivery. No patent. Nobody's going to be a billionaire with that. But we're using technology to improve what goes on for the kids. So and I'm a proponent of technology, but it has to be used within a plan of care. You just don't give it to them and say, okay, you're on your own. You got you to do something about it. So those are my thoughts on that one. You have another question. Yeah, I was just going to ask, um, that seemed like a great initiative. Um, we are a team composed of mainly undergrads with very limited resources. Do you think there is some sort of project we could take on to sort of make any impact in healthcare? Well, that's a good question. Um, the answer is yes, there ought to be several. I would say if you looked into what's going on at ASU to see, are there any programs doing that? And I think the best place to look at that would probably be at the College of Health Solutions. If you have made an appointment, go over there, talk to the Dean or talk to Dr. David Sklar. Uh, he's, um, uh, you know, he's not retired, he's still practicing, but he used to be the Dean of Medicine at the University of New Mexico. Uh, he's been a journal editor and he works in the emergency room at ValleyWise. Um, there are programs that Mayo Clinic is doing and Banner and Dignity and Honor Health. And I know they exist, but I know it's the medical students that are involved with that. I don't know if it's undergrads. That, that's, that's just my lack of knowledge. But uh, Sklar might know, or the people, because they have a relationship, because the College of Health Solutions does have a program in the science of health care delivery. And that's a master's program. I know master's programs are involved too with that. So I would just say that the best there ought to be, I, I know other places where there are programs like that in bigger big cities, but Mar Maricopa is a little bit uh, on the slower side. It's if you were in Minneapolis, there'd be lots of things you could do because there are unique programs that are in place there across the board. And that's because their payment model is different than fee for service. In Maricopa, we get paid when people are sick. In the Twin Cities, there are many, many plans that are a different payment model. It's called a capitation model. And you get you as a provider get a certain amount of money and you have to work to keep the patient really healthier. And when you do, that's when you make money, keeping them out of the hospital, monitoring them. But there really are very few programs like that here other than Phoenix Children's. Like I mentioned, they have asthma. I think they have five or six programs like this that are being run by their nurses. So if you're interested in thinking about it, yeah, I think you just have to push on or look around. I, I don't. I, I'm, at, I'm working at the senior level. I don't really know how much of that goes on here. I think after my 14 years of being here, because uh, I retired from Mayo and I started right here, I would have heard about them, but I don't know many. So I don't think there can't be that many. But if they are, they'll be through the College Health Solutions. Okay. Thank you so much for that.
Yep. Um, now I want to open it up to the audience. If the audience has any questions they would like to ask. Um, I don't know how much time you have, Dr. Cortez. Uh, but... You go ahead, ask, ask the questions and I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll hang around till you get your answers. Yeah. All right. So did anyone, any, uh, anybody want to go ahead and uh, ask any questions? I had one. Um, can you tell us about your motivations and mindset that compelled you to um, work in health policy? Um... Oh, that, okay, yeah, very, very simple. Very simple. I never planned on it. That's number one. Number two, when I wanted to be a doctor, when I was 13 because uh, of things that happened to my parents and I, I was engaged in a lot of things anyway. I was only interested in clinical practice. I ended up at Mayo Clinic. I've, I've done research. I've done training programs. I did administrative work, and I did clinical practice. But for me, under stress, I default to patient care, period. It's all about patient care. The patients are the only ones that count. The federal government began to do some rule changing in, two, in the 1970s and in the 80s in their payment models and how they started to tell us how to practice medicine. There was a time at Mayo Clinic up until about 1985 or so when we, we, we all had a, a little pad in our pocket for our specialty area that had all the prices of the things we ordered. We talked prices with the patients. We went over what we were trying to do. And the patients actually would work with us to figure out what was the best thing to do. And I was allowed to say no charge. I could do stuff and say there's no charge. Medicare stepped up in the mid 80s and said, you have to charge patients. Now they're telling us how to practice medicine. And it got worse into the later 80s. Um, I, won't, I won't give you all the examples, but it really got worse when they started to do fee for service payments. We always had fee for service, but they started to do price controls. They started to cut the prices that they would pay us for delivering of care. And all of a sudden we found ourselves thinking, well, then we have to charge somebody else more. It was just a, a crazy thing as they were cutting the prices and they still do that. And then they threw in relative value units in uh, 91, 91 or so. Relative value units basically is an adjuster to the amount you get paid for what you do. If you spend an hour with the patient, just talking with them, trying to take care of them, you would get maybe five RVUs. If you did a procedure like a colonoscopy, you would get about 25 or 30. The RVUs become a multiplier on what you're paid. Just think of the math. The math is a whole page long, by the way, when they set these prices. So with fee-for-service, which means we get paid when people are sick, price controls, which means if I want to keep making this amount of money I'm making, I just do more to everybody. I can do more, I get paid more. Do more things. And then with relative value units, if you're a specialist, you get paid a lot more than the people who just take care of patients. So right through the 80s, and about it was about 92, 93, that I, I, was, I was the vice president of the Mayo Clinic practice. That's why. I had just sort of had it, and I got mad. But frankly, I just got mad at what the government was doing. And, and whatever the government did, the insurance company shadowed it because they were all making money. And it was changing our ability to see patients, to do the things that we wanted to do. It was making the, the fact that if we do procedures, you get paid a lot more than spending time with the patient and trying to understand them and manage them. So it was a real struggle. And that's, that's when I started to get engaged with quality improvement projects. And I started, I was at Harvard Kennedy uh, uh, School of Government, uh, tried to have some influence there. We did national quality improvement projects. Mayo Clinic was one of 12 different organizations. We built major projects, did a lot of publications. Uh, we worked with CMS, uh, that's the Medicare group, to find new ways to get uh, things evaluated and paid. And then I really didn't get involved in actual the policy in the depth until we got to about 2004, three or four. Uh, because things were coming to a head. The Republicans wanted to go one way. They were doing Medicare Advantage plans, which were capitated plans, and the liberals, which were good plans, by the way, and they still are today. Matter of fact, half of the people enrolled in 
in Medicare today are in Medicare Advantage plans that were started around 2002, really pushed in 2002, and the liberals wanted to shut them down. Uh, Obama wanted to, wanted to close them down, and then he wanted to get some insurance. So I had I had to work with uh, uh, Clinton and Hillary Clinton. I did some work with uh, uh, um, uh, George Bush the second, and then in the Obama administration. Um, and I did it all through the auspices of the National Academy of Medicine and proposing solutions and ideas and pushing value-based care. But it was all about insurance. It was all about insurance. And my point is you're regulating the way we're practicing medicine and you don't have everybody insured even. The easiest thing to do in this country is to get everybody insured. We have plans on the shelf, just use them. We can just go to one plan. My proposal, our proposal was uh, one plan and that's the Federal Employees Healthcare Plan. The government, all the people in federal government have it. I suggested to the people in the White House, and they said, you can, you can sell this by standing up in front of the public and say, you get what we have. Just that simple. And it, we, we got so confused that they started to do a model of like the federal employees plan, but they did it in every state rather than do it at a national level. And that never took off because that, that's the ACA bill. And our argument was people should be, we should be finding a way to pay the providers for the value of their services, which means for whoever gets the best outcomes, the best safety, the best service, and the lowest costs should be paid in a way that they can stay in business, cover their costs, and they have to make a little profit. It's a very complex economic model that is so simple to think about. If you're doing well, why would they? Why would somebody want to come put you out of business? And that's what was happening in their in their re restriction of cutting back the payments. The people who were doing well started to move to different models of how they were delivering care. So. By the 2000s, here's what we were getting. Very little access, very few people doing primary care, lots of things being done to people with testing and procedures that were more than would be recommended, and a ton of specialists. So when you pay fee-for-service, use price controls, and you give RVUs out, which means more money to the specialist, we actually got exactly what we were paying for. And we wanted to change that dramatically. And that's when that's when most of the most of my run-ins at the political level occurred there in 2008, 2009, because the ACA bill came out of Washington and it was going to be passed in the summer of 2009. And Pelosi had it at the um, at the house. And it was nothing more than an insurance bill, nothing. And we had spent years trying to talk about different payment models, different models of caring for patients. And, and uh, we called that value-based care. And I was running a round table on value-based care at the National Academies. So we, that's when I got pretty heavily engaged. I was forced to do it. It wasn't something I wanted to do. This is what we did. And as the, as the CEO of Mayo, we actually uh, proposed an amendment and 40 Democrats signed up for it. And it was the call the blue dogs. And they said, we have to add something into this bill that has to do with new models of payment, new models of care. And the White House resisted it big time. Pelosi had a fit over it. I got called into the White House and had to talk to the, the key people. It was very uncomfortable. But I said, look, you know, uh, is this, <laughs> you, you keep telling me you're not getting what you pay for. Well, let's figure out a way to pay for what you want and get it done. And insurance is not going to be the answer. You need a lot more than that. So they, pull, they pulled the bill and it didn't come out until the 2010 in February. And it did pass. But by then they put a whole section to it with 20 different ways to pay differently for new models of care. And we're living through it right now. Uh, that those things are happening. And we're seeing more and more people sign up for these other different models uh, that are taking place. 
and some of them are run very well and some aren't it's the usual story so to answer your question it wasn't anything i tried to do it was only because somebody um it was basically because that you guys know who jerry garcia is any of you know he was the original uh, the, the original uh a, a guitar player and he's the founder of the grateful dead anybody remember that group i think they still perform a few times but anyway grateful dead so they got this this famous picture they were getting back together in 1993 to, to get on a tour but somebody took a picture of jerry garcia he's got his beard you know i've got the picture here somewhere but uh he's got a beard on and um he's holding his guitar he's got his little round glasses and the quote that goes with this was um somebody's got to do something it's just incredibly pathetic it has to be us and it had to do with getting something on the road but that was the quote and my chief administrative officer in 2002 walked into my office um one day and he basically said he put that picture in front of me and let me see I, i'm going to get this for you because it's really worth looking at because he made me feel oh gosh it was the horrible of my life i didn't want to have to do this but we had to do something oh that's right it's a build slide let me just do it okay well, here's the one I talked about, Will Mayo. This is, he came in and he showed me these two things. So there's Will Mayo. And this is 19, I don't know when that picture was done, probably around 1939, just before he died. And there's Jerry Garcia. So you get a picture of what he looks like. And then this is Jerry, he's Grateful Dead. And he says, somebody uh, has to do something. It's just totally pathetic. It's got to be us. And this was put in front of me. And then he showed me the other one, Will Mayo saying, the needs of the patient <laughs> and he killed me on that one and that's what that's when i started to get involved with this because frankly i was um, very upset about how i had seen actual reduction in what we were able to do in the past we were able to see patients pull them in at any time we could no charge we can just see them short periods of time we'd have to document everything single thing and auditing we were actually doing a better job taking care of the uninsured and people who were homeless back then than we are today. It's much more rigid and structured. So that's the best I can answer answer your question, or all the the the. Uh, it is what it is. I didn't set out for this, and uh, you. you it, it, but I've, I've been pretty successful with it in regard because I'm just driven by just one vision. That's it. And what are we going to do for the patients? And every time a politician talks to me, I quickly ask him. Edward Kennedy came to my office one day in Rochester, and he wanted to talk about this value thing. And I just sat him down. I said, Senator Kennedy, I never met him before. He, he, he just wanted to come, and he heard we were working on value. And I said, Senator Kennedy, do you want to go to a hospital tomorrow? And silent. You want to be sick tomorrow? Right? you're a patient i look at you you're pre-op here this could be you're just a pre-op person so if you had a problem like this what would you do who you call you got somebody now, of course he probably had a lot of support staff and all of that but the point is that's the only stakeholder in healthcare, in my viewpoint is the patient all the rest of us like maybe the doctors and nurses they're the ring right around them the next ring all the rest everything else are just vendors and commodities but today they have been successful enough to turn the the frontline workers into the commodities they've turned us into the commodities and you have to you know, somehow we have to turn that around and start talking about how are we going to take care of these patients and they have to stop telling us how to practice medicine but they need to hold us accountable for being able to actually improve things and get to see these patients like we like we like is our obligation but right now we're just look what happened in covid people got burned out that burnout it didn't happen during covid it got started once we started using electronic medical record because the electronic record was supposed to really help us but somebody has to enter everything 
And they threw that on top of the people in the front lines. The nurses had to enter a whole bunch of stuff. Doctors had to enter stuff. Instead of having resources to help you get it done, the people on the front lines were now being burdened by all these wonderful new ideas that were being pushed by the government and um, industry, um, which were all great ideas. Listen, I'm a big fan of electronic medical record, but I'm not a big fan of having the frontline workers have to pull it up and find it and do it and log in over and over again. They need to have access to it when they need it and they're taking care of the patient. So that's another fight that I've been fighting. And you see that it has a, you'll see when you get out and practice, it'll be, you'll, you'll have fun trying to deal with it, but I'm trying to build a pipeline of people like you who will demand something better. And, and just, just say this, we, we can do better. And artificial intelligence ought to be, you know, it's going to be used wrong. You know, it's going to cause trouble, but it has a great potential and you all have to demand that it be used to help you get knowledge, the knowledge part. It's not going to have the other half of intelligence. Intelligence re requires knowledge and the ability to use it. This is the emotional quotient part, your ability to relate to people, turn it into some action. And you just have to demand this. And I just think they'll come through it so fast, they'll be over here trying to have robots and all the rest of it too quickly. And it's we're going to lose the potential of having really good knowledge base. So in all my classes, I let the students use whatever they need to use in artificial intelligence, but it has to help them establish a knowledge base. And then with that, I want to see how they make use of it, you know, how they apply it or make use of it. So I do, you know, cheat all you want on the knowledge side far as I'm concerned, because when, when you start practicing medicine, you leave medical school, when you're in medical school, you have to take tests and you're not allowed to cheat. I get that. I, I advise that they do training in how to cheat, but basically, and what I mean by that is that when you leave medical school, the first night you're on call and a patient comes in and say, doc, this patient's out here, they got a belly pain and they're really in trouble. You go see the patient, you're going to panic because now what do you do? You examine the patient, you, you fall back on your training, and then you're going to have to either have the knowledge in your head or know who to call to get an answer for a question or how to look it up. And the rest of your life is going to be like that on the knowledge side. So I say cheat all you need to. Call the right people, call your colleagues, use whoever you need, you bring your team together on the knowledge side. Don't just rely on what you remember. Because if as you get older, you'll remember less. You have less of a base. But then, then this the art of medicine comes in. Now that you know this might be the right thing to do for this patient. Well, it could be this person has an appendicitis. What's the right thing to do right now? I'm not sure he's got it. If you're sure you got it, you call the surgeon or you're the surgeon, take them in and do the operation. But if you're not sure, what's the one best test to do? What's the best thing to do? And after you've done it once, you'll never forget it, but it's a CT scan. Now, 30 years ago, we didn't have CT scan. So what the best thing was is to operate, in those days, it was to operate on somebody who didn't have appendicitis. In other words, it was okay to operate up to like 15% of people who you think have it, but they turned out not to, because it's better to err on the side of trying to remove the appendix than it is to overlook a hot appendix that can actually kill the person if you miss it. So it was better to err on that side. CT scans came out. We could we can determine who needed it and who did. And when they came out, it took about 15 years before anybody would pay for the use of the CT scan in the emergency room for this purpose, for instance. Because the people who don't practice medicine just said, oh, that was too expensive. That was a very high value tool. It was more expensive. Yes, it was. But it's expensive from your pocketbook. On the other hand, operating on 15 people out of 100 who don't need an operation, that was pretty expensive too, maybe worse from the patient's viewpoint. So that's where if you got, if you're going to be a doctor. You got to be thinking about what's the best thing to do. And um, when you get out and practice, 
build your colleagues, build your teams, learn, learn what's going on. Uh, use, use them, they'll use you, share information, learn from everybody, and then your skill will determine how well you take care of patients in the longer term, you know, how you actually apply it. Okay, that was a long answer there. I'm sorry, Earl, but, but I, I get so excited about medicine. I like, and I like to see the young folks thinking about it, but I really want them to have a higher standard of expectations. Just don't go in and take the step tests so you can get into dermatology or get into some other specialty where you're not actually taking care of patients like radiology and others. Those are really good specialties, don't get me wrong. But if you go into medical school without having the desire to really care for people, uh, you'll, you'll find so many pressures that, that uh, it'll be hard to resist going into different directions. Anything just, else, uh, Arash? Uh, I was just going to ask if anybody else had uh, any questions. Otherwise, we can uh, go ahead and wrap up the event. All right. Okay. Well, listen, I'm always available to talk to students. It's, it's, it's great to see you all being interested in getting involved and seek out some stuff. If you're looking for something to do, look at a challenge or two. Well, just look at the mental health one. I mean, there's a, there's a systematic problem here. Heat is another area, by the way, that's, that you ought to look at. Pope Mosley is uh, on the staff, Dr. Pope Mosley. Uh, he's in the College of Health Solutions. He got hired last November, international expert on heat-related causes. He's a pulmonary doc like me, ICU doctor, the same. I've known him for many years. He's now on the staff, and he's working on uh, getting a grant to start different projects to try to take care of people in Maricopa County who would be at very high risk for aggravating their condition in a heat environment, you know, in a hot summer. And those are people with heart, heart disease, lung disease, for instance, diabetes can be a huge problem. Uh, mental health, big problem with mental health in the heat. So uh, he, he'll be launching some programs um, coming up also I don't know if he's looking for undergraduate students or not. That I can't answer. All right. Okay, well, good luck to you all. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, talking with us today, Dr. Cortezzi. You're, well, you're welcome. Take care. Bye-bye. All right.